Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO The Last of Europe in which we're using a sub-mod called TNO Brave New World. Now I've done this mod before, but it's also known as the New Order, the Second West Russian War Co-Talker update uh, with basically Brave New World. So um, basically we're, once again, for the, like my third or fourth time, we're playing as Novosovirsk. Right now as Alexander Pokrushkin. We might keep him, we might not keep him. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, we'll see at the beginning. Also, if you want to read about this, this stuff over here, well, onwards, please go ahead. The Falcon's Nest, uh, the Siberian Falcon, the Siloviki, and to raise an eagle, the Vasily Shukshin. Not just a province. The features, of course, play as Shukshin and successor, stabilize, reunify, and lay low the German eagles in the Japanese sun. So basically, this is brand new content, especially as we get closer to unifying all of Russia and then taking on Germany as well. Uh, so, the, Russia itself, of course. And then, uh, as of now, only Novosibirsk, specifically Shukshin, has any content after 1972, although they'll expand on it later. And the update, oh, that's cool. So we're using the Code Doctor update, like I said earlier. So, so BBA compatibility by blood alone, adding post unification pass for the Federation with unique mechanics. Awesome. So it looks like we're going to get Shukshin again. The beginning. Alexander Merokin shoved his hands into the pockets of his jacket as he walked down the street to Novosibirsk. His hands shook as he approached the warehouse. He glanced back down the way he came, half expecting to see corporate goons following him. Up ahead, he could see a red ribbon wrapped around the light pole. They agreed upon signal that the meeting was on. Alexander was taking the biggest risk of his life going into the meeting, but he was desperate. The factory he worked at had been bought up by the Siberia Corporation, and the new regulations they'd imposed had left him practically penniless. He could only just afford his room at the flop house and went without food on most nights. You know, I'm poor, but not that poor. He knocked at the door in the appropriate pattern and waited. The door opened and he was dragged inside. In the dim light of a candle, he could see the group of five men and women gather on what looked like the floor plan of a factory. The woman who dragged him through the door looked up, and looked him up and down before gesturing him to the table. Welcome, comrade. Tell me, why are you here? She demanded. To fight for the people of Novosibirsk and to end the tyranny of the Soloviki or Solovik regime, he responded. He had read the pamphlets and attended a couple of secret meetings before this, though none as important as this one. The woman looked satisfied by his response, if not particularly enthused. The woman looked back over the floor plan she spoke again. Before she spoke again, welcome, Comrade Sinti or Sini. We must prepare for your first assignment. The pigs of the Sibir Corporation have opened a new manufacturing plant for the production of the top of the line small arms. It'll be your job to leave the plant of its new manufacturing specs and to cause as much damage to the plant as we can. Alexander, or Comrade Sini, as he was now known, felt his throat tighten as a submachine gun was pressed into his hands. Any second thoughts were quickly silenced by the fire he saw in the woman's eyes. This was for the people. It would be all worth it in the end. The revolution finds its roots in its young. Also, if you'd like to check out uh, this mod for yourself, Brave New World, please. Uh, check the description below. Join my Discord server if you haven't already. And it'll be the first link there. Land of the Strong, though. The Federation of Novosibirsk in Altai is the largest splinter state that's, se that's separated from the Central Siberian Republic, even rivaling its remnant to the north in terms of power and military might. That's President. The aviator Alexander Pokrushkin, who's commonly known as a falcon, runs the state in an increasingly authoritarian manner. Novosibirsk has also been overwhelmed by the wave of refugees that came from the evacuation eastward, which has caused a multitude of issues. The falcon and his government have to will have to find solutions to the problems that have started to torment his people if he's to unite the region. Champions of industry. Veterans of the Siberian War, their internal situation. Well, I want to focus on the economy as much as we can. Expand the security agencies, more political power would be nice. It's not very much, but that'd still be very nice. Supply consumption goes down to 15%. Oh my god. Um, it looks like Shukshin is really the only guy who has the most. So, Champions of Industry. So, we really need to talk about that a lot. And, ooh, growth increases. Champions of Industry. One hallmark that distinguishes the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altai. For the likes of the mystical king of Komarovo, the Black Army in Kansk, and the Republican Tomsk is the presence of corporations that dominate the daily life of its citizens. Three of the most dominant are the Phoenix, Sibir, and Titan, each specializing in the different sectors of the economy. The Phoenix, most aggressively pro Silovik of them all, are manufacturers of military equipment. The Sibirs, who are vaguely aligned with the mayor Shukshi of Arnal, as the primary source of our agricultural tools as well as the financial experts. Lastly, so there's the Titans, the leading pioneers and technocrats within Novosibirsk society. When the time comes, President Pokrush will have to decide where the legions lie. Perhaps down the road he may even choose the people instead. All is possible in the city where the sun sets. So, even though I do want to try different corporations, um, uh, Shuk we're, prob we're probably going to go Shukshin. Probably. Um, I don't know. They're conservatives. And Phoenix. Uh, as much as I want to take the all these guys over. So, right, right, go over here. We're like Irkutsk, Siberian Black Army. We're not that far over. Um, we're all the way over here. Take over. Only neighboring states can be influenced, and only Siberian warlords until 1969. So, increased pressure, cost of political power. We could do all this stuff, but we're probably not. Loyalty and power. 
Um, I want as much loyalty and as little power for a lot of these people as possible. Our primary goes to successfully take over all the nearby states in Central Siberia and all of Russia itself. We'll complete missions for warlords and whatnot. Uh, so, in order to speed this process as much as possible, attempt to become ideologically aligned. The faster we are closer to a warlord ideologically, the faster our takeover progress will grow, and the more ideologically distant, the slower. Um, so, and you can see this by this red button down here. To influence the current ideological standpoint, we may take focuses or empower certain megacorps. The stronger the megacorp, the more we'll lean towards their ideology. Maybe your current ideological drift in the button below this one and hover over the uh, blue dot. Megacorps are not just helpful to drift to our ideology, but the more powerful it is, the easier it is to assimilate warlords of that megacorp ideology. However, should megacorp loyalty fall under 50, this will turn into a malice and not a bonus. So, so we click on this one, corporatism, we're right in the center. The power of each megacorp will heavily influence our strong a political stance. A strong phoenix will get, make us more unitary, severe make us more federal, town will become more corporatist and populist, a strong populist make us more collectivist. So, that tells us where we're at. In the conservative, uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Ideology, um, this will tell you, is one of the main three economic groups, and has long ties with Alexander Pokrushkin. So, that's the kind of group we have right now. There's also Sabir, who's relatively loyal. Um, so, associated with the Meyer of Barnall. So, um, so, this is the one we really want, which I usually go with Sabir. Titan. As a federation's muscle. Oh, no, no. This is uh, the brain. The intellectuals, basically. So that's really cool. Which is kind of not looking good right now. And then the people, of course. More political power. Well, we'll see. Well, oh, also, we have some stuff here. And the quiet flows on. Or it flows the ob. Vasily Shukshin, and he used to love sitting by the river ob. Went back when they had first accepted the mayorship of the barn in the infancy of Pokrushkin's new state. It was a beautiful town of unfettered idealism and shaky hope in the mirky future. And in between debates and briefings, Ob's glittering waters were always waiting for him. He would find a perch on the rocks, gazing out of the gently rippling waters and listening to the distant cries of birds with the murmur of the river. Idle thoughts would drift lazily through his head, or on some days he would scribble away at some unborn writing project, or simply lay up on the shore in a half sleep stupor, dreaming of things to come. Now, however, things were changing. The waters were getting filthier by the day as more businesses moved into town, raising factories and more along the Ob's bank. Although the Federation and Shukshin's own values lay beyond freedom, he cannot help but feel perhaps it was leniency that allowed these industri industrialists to lay claim to his home. In several meetings, Shukshin had brought up with his misgivings with the direction of the town's development, only to find many of his trusted aides in the new pocket of the very same hounds preying upon Barno's newfound prosperity. Thus, he went out to the river once again to think. Shukshin felt conflicted with the idea of pushing the pocketed officials out, each had, as each had gone there through their own merit. Part of him felt it was vanity, the idea of holding something as trivial as the beauty of the nostalgic river over his own values, and the fields just beyond the river, however. He saw men breaking the backs, their backs, where days wage dropped like crumbs by richer men. Was this corruption in and of itself a greater tyranny? So he had to tackle this problem one way or another, but how, when only felt like he could see Russia's pain? Is he alone? And we stuff here too. I like external investments. External investments is actually really nice. Uh, I want to do that one, but we also have the old uh, Legacy of the Siberian Plan. Yay! Cap, growth, construction speed would be nice, factory output would be nice as well. Um, so here, if you wonder about that, please go right ahead. Uh, as far as I remember, discontent doesn't really matter too much, but I could be wrong. You never know what's been changed, so. Spend a lot of money, decrease, increase IC, decrease efficiency gain, which is kind of fun with me. Um, more capacity, more gain, but less maximum efficiency. Increases construction speed, I like that. Ooh! Increased production quotas, more growth, and more IC, but increased disc, disc, uh, discontent. This one, eh, we'll definitely take that one. Okay, let's keep spending more money. And the next one we do, we might do external investments for the modern, modern Bogatir. If you want to buy that, please go right ahead. As we're trying to get more loot as well. Uh, the Veterans of the Siberian War. One of the greatest advantages Nova Siberia has over its regional opponents is our comparatively large and experienced army. An army whose soldiers cut their teeth on the front lines of the Siberian War before our eventual secession from the Republic that has since shrunk back into Tomsk. By our studying our recent ba past battles and examining our successes and failures, we can improve the effectiveness of our forces. The experience of our troops will likely give us a great advantage in future conflicts, as the armies of our neighbors remain undisciplined and under-equipped. The evening tides. The sun, the evening passed, Alexander Prokushkin by like a warm sunset tinged blur. The president of the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altay, to use his long-form title that even he found cumbersome. Was well, so hosting a dinner to honor the veterans of the Great Patriotic War. A few of them were his friends, but all were comrades. In the neatly ceramic tile dining chamber, the baldy jokes of the aces echoed down the silent halls, booming through the rooms of the presidential palace, as we have a cup of coffee or two. Some of them did not partake in the festive occasions, however. Standing on the edges of the crowds were silent onlookers whose faces were tinted with a colorless pallor of long of joy lost, long lost. The war might have left Novosibirsk and Altea for now, for these it never left them. The call it a battle fatigue shell shock. But Krishkin sighed, there was never cure for the eternal affliction of soldiers. A hand tapped his shoulders, Mr. President. A powerful voice thundered behind him, catching Pokrushkin off guard, long down to see. The man looked askance at him, as if expecting a trigger to click in his head. Aye, the man started, the voice quieter than before. We were in the academy before, you know the flight school. 
Oh, nice, nice to meet you, Mr. Apologies, it's been a bit. Surely you can understand the occasional forgetfulness on my part. No, 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 that's not important. I hand wave his apology off. Still got your head in the clouds? Bokushkin arched a curious eyebrow. I don't seem to recall. Can I entreat you to enlighten me? No need, Bokushkin watched as he left the passive crowd and into the night. A curious fellow, but up in the sky. As an old plane, a gift from the free aviators weaved through the skies, Alexander Bokushkin could not help but reminisce about the war. He remembered the sounds of explosions, the shrieking of rending metal, and the screams of wounded men. He remembered the hordes of horse vessel lead. Oh, there's a spare. Actually, that's really good. Um, as the Germans blared it from every radio tower in Moscow, and at last of all, he remembered the flight east and the tens of thousands of good people who had perished in the jackboots and inexorable march. Not all was lost, he told himself, as he watched the ground underfoot. The outside soldiers had drifted, a uh, drilled on top of it. He had this. But Krishkin didn't want to be a leader of a flight squadron, much less a state, and yet those under his care not only survived, they thrived. Things weren't perfect, of course. The terrors plagued his lands were proof of that, but nevertheless, life was tolerable. He pushed a stick forward, a smile filling his weathered face as he dove down, dived down. He never really had time to fly these days, nor the opportunity. Always an AA gun from Tomsko Kamarovo, always a Kazakh raiding party that strayed too far, always a foe that needed combating, but today was not one of those days. Today he was free. As he wheeled around to face home, Pokrushkin could help but marvel the city his forces controlled. The smoke of the factories of Novosibirsk was almost comforting. The distant booming and lights of the artillery that had once been terrifying felt in some strange way familial. He didn't want to be a leader, but he knew that if he did not fight for his people, then someone far off or far worse than he would. As long as he still drew breath, and the Siberian Falcon would defend the people of Novosibirsk. Perhaps one day, all of Russia. Perhaps one day, a devil fly too. Also, I didn't re remember this. I forgot this. Uh, you, you, you cannot get goring. If you get goring for this route that we're going, uh, it's going to crash. Uh, as, according to the Steam page, which you can read, uh, you know, by yourself, but uh, for yourself. Um, so, also, the currently Code Talker does not work with any other mods, any sub monster to you know. So it is what it is. Um, so goring is broken. But silent warfare. This is a big state of a unique resource when compared to other warlords of, of Russia. While others may have to rely on ideological similarities, violence, or tense negotiation to work with each other. Uh, the other warlords, the Silovic State can dig their claws in a nation without even them realizing it. They can tip their rivals for unification in the direction of their own uh, interests. This resource allows the state to sneak its way into the government of their rival, slowly aligning the opponent's interests with their own through a gradual takeover of several or all sectors of government and even daily life. This resource, of course, is a vast and powerful businesses at the Silovic State disposal, in addition to the political and economic and military pressure they can put on their neighbors. See, corporations have a funny way of getting what they want from a country, as people and as government, if they're more powerful than their targets or clients are stubborn. Economic pressure and integration is a mighty thing, and the first step to that also oh, to take over that the Silovic states rely on to move forward a bloodless but dirty alternative. Good. Ah, what do we want here? We want to get equipment. So here we need more, uh, some of that. So, that's okay. The business of states. The Federation's cabinet room had hosted many important discussions of state, including military, social, and otherwise. Today, however, the focus was economic, and instead of politicians, it was corporate executives who sat across the ornate conference table from President Borkershkin. Representatives from all major firms operating within Novosibirsk, they had come, following overtures from his government, to discuss a series of potential deals that could be made, deals that they could, Borkershkin knew, not only have a tremendous impact on the Federation's economic future, but also on the very lives of the hundreds of thousands of workers within it. He very much wanted to close these deals. But he also knew keenly that they would not come with a cost. The men across from him were, to a one, sharks beyond measure in their field, a field in which he held very little experience. They would not agree on everything that would benefit him or the Federation without ensuring that it would, to a greater extent, benefit them. But Kushkin was prepared to accept that. The Federation needed these men and the organizations that they represented. It needed their factories, it needed their capital, it needed their employment, and above all, it needed their support. They could cause no end of trouble for him and his government if they opposed it in any form. So he flashed them with a wide smile, began to speak. A mutually beneficial partnership? So being bitter? Um, increased Phoenix? Or Sibir. Honestly, with the way we're going to go with Chukshin, uh, we have to go with him again. I know, some of you are probably disappointed, but I want to see what else they add with him. So, um, let's see. Yeah. So, we really want Sibir. Sibir. So, we're probably good with that one, even though I'm sure I've read that one before, too. Uh, but before we do that, what else can we do here? Oh, we can do more here. That'd be nice. Uh, economy wise, that's not good. The GDP ratio is going up pretty high. Um, I want to do as much as we can here. But let's go, let's get one external investment. So we can wait. So basically, my plan is this we use this once in a while, increases state GDP growth as well, get a little bit of money, increases uh, our liquid reserves by a little bit, which is very, actually, very nice. And then we'll do that once in a while, and then we'll keep doing these ones as well as uh, try to get more uh, political power for raids, and of course. Uh, treasure. The Sabir Corporation has a bit of an odd history regarding its founding. In the public image, it is associated with the Mayor Baranov, Vasily Shukshin, one of the rare civilian politicians that had found success within Novosibirsk, a Silovic-dominated political force. 
Founded by the landowning bourgeoisie state that come into existence after the fall of the Central Siberian Republic, they produce agricultural equipment and produce as well as financial institutions that have helped many in Soviet Siberia escape the poverty of the working class. The question is both political and economic. The Fenix have been in business in a relationship with the Federation since the founding and signing contracts with Siberia's at risk. However, Russia will not be at war forever and the military equipment will not help us against the group of poverty. If the president wishes to quell extremist thought within his Federation, the best antidote may be economic prosperity. A hero before the people. Governor Sidney walked through the brightly light halls of the bunker here in the HQ of the Gnarlednik movement. He felt free in a way he never felt before. Though his youthful face was now marred by shrapnel scars, the smile on his lips could not be denied. His comrades stopped and saluted as he passed. A fact which took him by surprise even now after months among the ranks. He walked into the deepest layers of the bunker towards the comrade's command center. As he walked, he could not help but reminisce. His first mission with the Narodniks had been a resounding success. The plan had been destroyed, and the weapon schematics had been vital to the continued success of the movement. From there, Sini had participated in countless operations against the Federation forces and the corporations they serve. Magnates and politicians have fallen by his hands. Entire Federation supply convoys have been hijacked and diverted. In a particularly memorable mission, he had destroyed an entire Titan manufacturing plant with little more than a pipe bomb and a well-placed bottle of American soda. Finally, this entered the command center. Every surface was covered in maps, mission briefings, and reports. At the center of this controlled chaos was the leader of the movement, Comrade Chevny. Chevny was an old grizzled veteran of the Great Patriotic War. Welcome back, Comrade Senior. I hope you are well rested. It has come time to go forward with a decapitation strike. The dude, Pokushkin, will be attending the demonstration of some kind of fighter plane. Uh, it is your duty to kill the dude. Sini was in shock. The magnitude of this mission eclipsed any, any he had embarked in before. Pokrushkin's death would be the culmination of years of planning, and, he, and it all came down to him. It was ready. Pride goeth before a fall. But what do we have here? War planning, not worth it. Uh, Implant worker concessions, spend money, not worth it. Um, Severe Black Army, I don't think that'd be worth it either. Uh, cost 35 political power, which we're not going to spend for that, so. Uh, let's go over here. Oh, look at that. Points of pavilion. Ah, much better. Just got to focus on that just a wee bit. Over here, get a gross of assault or offensive. We want to be offensive. Oh, wait. We just... Oh, god dang it. I should not have spent that. Uh, whatever. My bad. I should have not gotten that. You know what? You know what? Oh, well. I make a mistake. Whatever. Oh, and we're saving for the next month as we take a sip of coffee, my friends. Stay thirsty, because my god, I'm always thirsty. As we're trying to build a prison. Ha, <laughs> I love it. Build a fat prison, my friends. I think up here, improve resource extraction. Construction speed goes down a little bit. Resource extraction is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I prefer to do these two first, though. Truth be told. Loyalty of Sibir. Ah, memories of the war. Gentlemen, it is an honor to have Mr. Sovarov, a veteran of the legendary Siberian War, here with us today. Please welcome him. The applause of the respected veteran rose from his seat was much louder than when the seemingly irrelevant commander stood up to introduce him. After greeting his old friends, he sat down again and spoke to the young recruits about his experience. Question after question, he answered them all directly with honesty. Mr. Sovarov, how did you come to be an instructor in the Federation's army, one of the soldiers asked? The veteran was quick to reply, you see. Back when I was in the army, things were not so bright in these lands. The old republic was fighting a seemingly endless war against the U.S. Hawks, but it was failing and I felt like I had to do something about it. That was when I met President Pokrushkin, who was one of the few to look at the situation not through overly idealistic lenses. He was interrupted by someone asking if he had really met the president, but he shrugged it off as nothing to import him. He was planning to bring peace to the Novosibirsk and Alte, and I decided to join him in the endeavor. As you know, we succeeded, and here we are. Mr. Sovarov, is it true you fought off a communist tank on your own? That is a real story, yes, he replied chuckling. We had been in the forest up north when we were attacked by a tank unit. I was away for my platoon, but I was quick enough to grab an old anti-tank weapon and fire it. Unfortunately, others were not so lucky. One of my friends died trying to distract an invading unit. There was silence for a moment, but the mission was still successful. It was a sacrifice like these that got us where we are now, and at a sacrifice like these, it will be necessary to restore order to the nation once and for all. Any other questions? Old soldiers never die. Increase loyalty of the people. I kind of like that. Um, daily broadcast sheet. Glory to the Pioneers, Titan versus the people. Well, right now, they don't mind us too much, and I want I kind of want to do Titan so they don't hurt us so much. So we'll probably do Titan next. Weekly business. Save a scan the plaza, a marketplace, and a rural community not too far from Novos Abyss. Only a few peasants set up their stalls this early in the morning. Terrible security hazard for the president of the Federation to be in the public for something as mundane as a meeting. Yet Seva also knew that in Novos Abyss, a little display of trust often went a long way. The soldier looked towards the reinforced limousine behind him. His boss was no doubt thinking about the meeting ahead, or thinking about the other meetings of the day, or not thinking at all, daydreaming about whatever it is that the Siberian Falcon occupied his mind with. Seva knew he couldn't keep up with his boss. That was why the boss was, well, the boss. Another dark limousine. A lone man came out of the car, hands empty. Seva looked step forward, his hands away from his own weapon. Mr. Chenevsky? Yes? 
The man shook his head, opened the door to reveal his own boss, a short, stocky type. Seva recognized a man, a former military intelligence analyst. Van Seva, they were open. President Pokrushkin emerged from his vehicle. Any tension from the meeting evaporated as a bodyguard stepped aside and the two powerful men shook hands in exchange formalities. Seva soon found himself holding a crate of documents. Chernyanevsky's bodyguard held a manila folder. What was in it? Pokrushkin gave, often gave money to financial insider news in such courtesy calls. Chernyanevsky was an up-and-coming Silovic, a man with a growing network of his own. It was a good business to pay respect to men of this caliber. A conversation over. Janyashevsky uh, disappeared in the car and drove away at high speed. Uh, Seva took note of the riflemen on the roof, relaxing their stances. It paid to be prepared for anything when one of the work in the business of presidential security. The bodyguard sat in the back of the Prokushkin's car, finally allowing himself a moment of rest. He boss, his boss looked in a particularly jovial mood. Leafing through the intelligence report, the president smiled contently. It seems that old man Pasternak is on the move again. War boss? Seva asked. Prokushkin shook his head and smiled. No, not war. Perhaps the end of peace. Russia's waking up. Keep an ear to the ground. Also, like investing in infrastructure too. Also, investing investing in industrial investments is very good, as well as recon. Actually, I might reconnect uh, the power grid because right now this is very bad for us. Oh my gosh, that's so bad. Progress is taking is a sole word of the Titan Corporation, specializing in delivering technological solutions to mundane problems. They become the forefront in Siberian Central Siberian science, beating directly with the modernists and Tomsk. Considering what they they were cut from the same cloth, there's no wonder that they're so successful. However, unlike the idealist modernists, the scientists, technocrats, and investors of the Titan Corporation do not care much about the contribution to universal science. They are a scientific organization within a free market. Therefore, they must compete. Sadly, the ass apathy extends their uh, labor practices. With long hours and hard work expected, the average employee? The Federation will invite the wrath of the people should it choose a side with the Titan. However, we are not so privileged to pay the price of progress. Ah, oh, infantry weapons. We will slowly, continually improve our infantry weapons as well. Ah, uh, we can always upgrade that later. And the later, the Siberian bear. The cleansing staff of the Siberian building had done a heck of a job, Grigory Alangamok thought. It seemed that the polish touched every aspect of the building, inch by inch. A receptionist ushered him into a waiting room. I apologize on behalf of the Siberian Corporation, she said. However, our executive officers tending to a vital guest. I hope you'll understand. The identity of the guest was apparent. It was none other than the notable or notorious, if it had been in certain government circles, Mayor Barnall. Langemach had chosen it today in hopes of citing the mayor, but alas, however, the contract the government shall sign with the Sibir Corporation would bring them closer together. Langemach smirked. But Krushkin knew how these corporations work. The bottom line was far more crucial to the livelihood of these corp companies than infrequent visits from an eccentric po actor politician. He took a seat and waited, taking his watch in between reading magazines sponsored by the Sabir. Most of them were agriculture-related, and most of them depicted golden fields of wheat, the grains un undulating under the gentle wind. He waited for the close to an hour before the receptionist returned, wearing a sheepish smile on her face. I'm so sorry for the delay, sir, she said. Our guest just left. The executive officer will see you now. Uh, about town, long take him, Take me to him, if you please. Certainly, sir. With scratches of pens and thumbs of stamps, a new deal is signed. Yeah, we're definitely going to do this, because, my God, we need power. It's been a very long time since the last time I actually played something like this, so... But, always an even train. The Federation is, like any other polities, as they collectively arrange upon the interests of the many. Classes, corporations, unions, and the government, all these vie for supremacy within a system that allows for their forces to coalesce and compromise, as always. Uh, the Federation's political system is a zero-sum game. A move made somewhere can never be reverted. It is a harsh system, but politics have been... Pit pitiless and cruel since the beginning of time. As such, the President's decisions will matter in a lot of ways, but we cannot foretell what the future holds for the Federation. All he must do is to live with the consequences of his actions. Should they arise, Nuovo Sobelsk and Alte gaze at the future, and a cautious optimism rises in the hearts of its citizens. Someday, what Bukharin had built uh, <clears throat> in the center of this Siberia shall be the beating heart of a new Russian political system. Increases discontent by one, whatever, who cares. Uh, on the day of the Kit Farm. Can we gather more? Yes, good. There was a knock at the door. Dimitri leaped from his desk and rushed to the door. He knew his visitor was not the sort of man who could stand waiting for too long. Good day, gentlemen. Do come in. The gentleman walking into Dimitri's laboratory did not return the host's obsequent smile. They're professional errand boys, and they're here to run an errand. Is the cargo ready? Asked one of them on the right. Right this way. Dimitri led his guest towards the kennels at the back of the lab. As the man approached, a man, woman stopped petting one of the foxes inside and in a cold, correct manner, stepped to the side, allowing Dimitri to display the merchandise. The kits, seeming new playmates, congregated at the front of the kennel, tails wagging. The two visitors set straight to the work, removing their food and water dishes before carrying the kernels to a waiting truck outside. For all that is necessary to keep our research funded, I worry about what these foxes will end up, or where they'll end up, said Lumil. Ludmilla, Dimitri's assistant, as she and he hurried to clean and refill the dishes the couriers left. They'll likely get sold out to markets in Asia, and from there, if my theory is proved correct, they'll become the latest trend in exotic pets. Certain people who buy pets off the black market don't generally aren't the most humane sort. Uh, the two continue working in silence between the couriers' return trips until the truck was fully loaded. How much for that box in the window? Our own shock troops. That's not bad. Special forces attack and defense, even though we, don't we can start treating elite troops. Ooh, these guys are ours. Megan's infantry. Ooh. More production units, but they're useless without more energy. But industrial equipment is very nice too. Monthly population, lose stability, 
Track down on strikes, ramp up arms production. Increase GDP, that's nice too. Beating her at Siberia. Ooh, new contract. Ooh, more cost, I don't like that. Add an efficiency also increases. So doing all this stuff is very good. I want that stability though. But I want more GDP, so we're probably going to do this one and then rush over here, our own shock troops. Our generals have devised a plan to expand the scope of our armed forces, and by investing in a special training design to improve our unit's ability to strike fast and effectively through opposing armies. These soldiers will be skilled in breaking through enemy front lines and limiting the amount of damage future wars will have on our army and citizenry. Furthermore, the deployment of these elite troops will certainly continue to hide our military edge over the rest of the region and deter any warlord to stay foolish enough to plan an invasion against us. The pioneers of progress. Have you heard of Lysenko Langamog? I said... Asked the scientists who sat together with him, Mr. Fedor, whoever made the Titan building built it on ultra modern sensibilities, it seemed. Eschewing the rotund shapes of traditional modernist architecture. The straight lines that made up of the silhouettes of the structure were grotesque, but in a way it was unique. No other building the miles could match its utter disregard for traditional values. Its facade showed an unrestrained disdain towards anything it deemed to be stuck in the past. I have the man who introduced himself, as Fedor said, a tone of disapproving ringing clear. Everyone has heard of the rumors from the west at this point. Do you think that the Titan Corporation is any way similar to that? We have reports you see of its uh, excesses. Fedor laughed with humorless eyes, Mr. Langemach said, We hold Alessenko in contempt. You're talking about a man whose greatest contribution to science was to torture and butcher, wait and examine its grains for omens, like a Roman augur. His ideals are utterly heinous and barbaric, not to mention his brutal methods. I see, Langemach said, putting a hand on his chin, I apologize. Progress doesn't have, does have its costs, though. The Titan Corporation knows exactly who to pay. A buzzer rang in the hall. Seems like it's your turn, Mr. Langemach. He gave Fedor a smart nod. No progress is done without cost. So with that done and said, Titan, well... I get that much better. I would like to increase it, but we have other things to spend political power on, as the skies are ours. An air force is over asset to any force in Central Siberia, or indeed the rest of Russia, but Novosibirsk was fortunate enough to inherit the majority of the Central Siberian Republic's air force, along with many of its officers who are now make up of our government. Included among the officers who set up the government is the President Prokushkin, the Siberian Falcon himself. For improvement of the existing infrastructure and air bases, as well as the development of new technology of our air force, has proven a popularity amongst these ministers who plan to push forward these proposals. The skies of Central Siberia remain ours to control. As I should. Uh, anything over here that we really want? Um, I would like all this stuff, but we need a raid. That was my fault earlier. Actually, if we hover over this, they just don't have money. Or the treasure, because they spent it all. So in the meantime, we'll come up here. Improve extraction. I want to extreme mine this one more. More output is super important. Oh, who the heck is John Gorton? He looks ugly. Mechanized infantry. As one of the few states of Russia that still maintains a capable and decently sized industry, we should use it to our advantage and expand our mechanized forces. Our federations, our forces, will gain a great technological advantage as other states remain comparatively unarmored. The increase in maneuverability will also keep, uh, help to capitalize on any breakthrough we will make, which would make us become an unstoppable military force. Armor in this stage? Well, we can think about it. Beautiful. 10%. Ah, oh, good. We also want to focus on industry as well as much as possible, too. And get some more output, too. That would be beautiful. Ah! Ultimatum from the Principality of Kemerovo. Oh, looks like we're there already. Just in case, Kemerovo, which can be an extraordinarily difficult mission to beat up if they're not taken out early on, um, can be a huge pain in the butt. Should be sold as we are trying to save. Of course, if you want to read about an ultimatum, please go right ahead. But we're not going to back down. We've been dogged in for so long. And if anything, if we can raid them, that'd be great. Black Siberian Art League, new Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republics. I don't know anything about this group. Uh, oh, that doesn't look very good for them, does it? Oh, but plus twenty percent. Uh, so they got plus ten percent organization. Crap ton of manpower. Uh, Black League. They're probably going to be very strong. I don't want to fight them though. Um, Kazakhs. We could try the Kazakhs. Is that a river around there, or what's around here? Are they have forts. They don't yet. Planes, it's all planes. Well, actually, there's more planes down here. Actually, I think I'll go to the Kazakhstan. We should be able to win this one fairly easily. Um, they're not even attacking with anybody yet. Oh, shock troops, though. Fighters? Yes? Ah, that's good. Let's go to this one first. Enemies defeated, if you want to put that, please go ahead. Yay! More political power. I love it. And in the meantime, Mr. Smiley Man, come over here. Nikolai Skomorokov. Beautiful, my friends. He's so happy. 
Let's go to guys over the first, the Mile High Tour. Uh, this morning, a bunch of horsemen arriving in a caravan from Morosia stopped while, while uh, do, some tra doing some trading outside of Ixim. While the supplies I brought over were well needed, the Morosians brought a peculiarity with them. That is, one horseman was carrying an American flag. The traveler looked both incredibly like he belonged with the caravan, and yet incredibly out of place due to his body language and general appearance. Regardless, he was trading alongside his citizens and seemingly happy. Then he ran into some soldiers. Soldiers do not stop talking to you. My name is Steve, and I'm a tourist from America. I've heard of the aircraft plant here, and I've seen your planes soar all throughout the parts of Siberia. They're absolutely fascinating to me. Well, his Russian was rather broken, he could barely hold a coherent conversation. He was traveling with a native, explaining the situation. Zoya, she was called, he gave context to Steve's story and explained his desire to travel the Russian warlord states in order to document his experiences, of course. The soldiers wouldn't pass on an opportunity for some entertainment. They offered to take him to the capital where they would command commandeer an aircraft. Steve and Zoya generously accepted, and the soldiers decided to drift them to the capital, or drive them there. On the way, Steve was spinning eccentric. Heartfelt tales about his previous travels across eastern Siberia. This enchanted most of the soldiers, yet two of the most serious of the bunch, Evgeny and Anatoly, were infighting about which plane to take the young American up in. I'm telling you, Anatoly, he would love the old Soviet IL-10. Uh, the Americans eat that historical stuff up. No, 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 and that is a little fast and dangerous. We should take out the jet plane that Alexander was working on. After much debate, the two come to consensus with the other soldiers along, say, along say Steve and said that. Vintage Soviet plane? Experimental jet? Um, let's go with vintage Soviet plane. That seems more appropriate. And I don't want anyone to die in experimental construction stuff. So. Oh, more growth? At the expense of workers? Absolutely. Uh, lava goes up, straight down, and it's going back up. Beautiful. Margo loves men. Looking on in disgust, General Vasily and Margo love reviewed the airborne troops behind him. Uh, before him. They were certainly finer men than, uh, oh. Than most of the Federation had offered, and clearly did not mean much. They were relatively out of shape, possessed by all outdated equipment, and most of all were simply outrageous to any generals with a good sense, which Margolov liked to consider himself to be. If he didn't know any better, he'd swear that some of these men were more ratty than their parachutes, though that wasn't saying very much. Uh, let's see what we do about that. They needed modernization badly, especially in these times, with the Federation surrounded by enemies and potential enemies. Uh, there was no question about that. The only question was how should we go about modernizing them? Their training was in the most obvious way needing a reform, so certainly he could start there. Even if we were to acquire the finest of material, they would be no good hands with men unworthy of holding them. When the airborne troops started startled awake by his passing, nearly falling over, Margolev glared at the man in contempt. So they're going to take a lot and be a long and arduous journey. At least it wasn't too late. Entry 14, taken to the skies. Russia is truly a sight to behold from her skies. Well, I have to come to the anarchy by sea and I travel in by land to soar. Oh, hold on. Uh, among the clouds before the Urals is a lovely sight to behold. Should be paid. Ah, oh, beautiful. Um... The soldiers of Novosibirsk were never by my tail, and decided to bring out an old piece of history from the German conflict, an old Soviet IL-10 from the late 40s. She served a bit in the West Russian War, engaging in a few overcompetent ME-262s and providing ground support when she was able. Almost shot down in a fierce dogfight over Moscow when she was violently spared, or so my pilot Evgeny told me. Whether this is true or not, I do not mind. The only thing that mattered was my head among to the literal clouds and discomfort in the old piece of history. While we stay within the borders of Novosibirsk, and mostly along the Ob River, the sights and sounds of the serene Siberian countryside are absolutely breathtaking to behold from the sky, and it is surely something I will never forget, nor can do justice in this entry. When we landed, Evgeny gave me a brotherly hug goodbye and gave me instructions to safely head to Tomsk. Uh, travel safe, Tovarish. May your journey be marked with a heartfelt success. Those words will echo in my head for a very, very long time, and the appreciation deep in my heart can never be expressed funnily enough to slip the surely, to slip the surely bonds of earth and dance amid the soaring birds. Beautiful, my friends. Ooh. Beautiful. Love it. We're planning industrial investments. That'd be so good to do. Oh, look at that. Nice. Beautiful. Um, up next, we're going to go with... Ooh, let's go with workers. Yes. Those guys are ours, my friends. Venice Destiny Made Manifest. First, the Siberian plan would be nice to do, but... Some coffee first. Good job on Brazil winning the World Cup. Good job. Good job. Ah, uh, what do we want to do here? Train our troops. Focus on research. Academic base will begin to slowly improve. That's actually really nice. You lose a little bit of political power, but that's not actually that's not bad. You can start the ball rolling. You know what? Let's start the ball rolling. As much as I want to do more of the Central Siberian plan, and I'm completely ignoring this, in which we should not be ignoring this at all. Whatever. Um, we'll have time for that later. The future of the, the fruits of the Siberian plan. Nova Siberia was one of the places that benefited the most from Bukharin's Siberian plan. Since these times, our industry has been seen a large step up in its output. The Federation's economy is still developing because of it, and the new factories continue to open, advancements being made in the construction technology and the expansion of infrastructure across the state. All these factors have greatly improved our industrial efficiency, allowing us to produce a greater volume of equipment for our military, of course, bringing us another step closer to a national arena. The Virgin Lands campaign. 
wrap up arms production, the army will need more arms if it is to continue its, to expand large and to absolutely dominate the region and bring the rest of the lands of Central Siberia into the Federation. Through threats or force, an increase in production quotas for all armaments is to be ordered by the government to help with the expansion of the armed forces. Many of the recent actions of the government have upset the workers and it's unlikely to improve the situation. If the tensions persist, grave consequences will face the, uh, the Federation in the future. Oh, we need artillery, do we? Yeah, I can, I can see that. Did I, oh, did I not get artillery here? Huh. I think I missed, eh? Well, we definitely need artillery, I'll tell you that for sure. Um, in the meantime, check for anything else down there. Nope, nope, nope. Up oh, next, improve facility networks. Crack down on the strikes. Uh, workers have started to resort to direct action. Factories lay dormant and hollow throughout every city. Production has slowed at a sluggish pace. We can only assume that the workers have become uppity because of the unfair conditions, but we cannot concede or they will soon be asking for the earth. Our government has determined to crack these strikes down and put the working classes back to work. The crackdowns will escalate tension to the workers, but a few disgruntled factory laborers being put back to work should be a much more preferable outcome than consistent deadlock and economic inefficiency. Of course. Flying towards future. As Atnit Khan Sultan roared above the lens of the Federation one of his newest aircraft, he couldn't help but think that from such an elevated position they look a little different from those of Crimea. But though they may not have looked different, they very much were, and none of the day went by when he did not think of the plight both of his homeland and of his people, the Crimean Tartars. Well, the Nazi Jack would have fallen over them over twenty years ago and showed no signs of being lifted anytime soon. Indeed, what little news had reached Central Siberia from one of those lands, the entire peninsula had been treated as a colonial project by the German Kriegsmarine, and his people had, as they would have been expected, suffered terribly. To those few countrymen he had spoken over to over the years, there was little hope of ever changing this, and for a long time he had thought the same. But the aircraft now sat and had changed those thoughts. The Federation had many challenges, yes, but unlike many of the states around it, it was still innovating. It was still designing, while others looked to the past, looked forward socially, technically, economically, and militarily. It was looking forward to the unification of Central Siberia and eventually even look beyond. Perhaps in time, we could once again look upon the lands of the Crimean Tartars, and on that day, the lands below his aircraft would not just be, look like his own men, they would be them. A dream to one day realize. As we're continuing to ramp up production. Has Burgundy finally done it? Oh, you bet they have. They're gonna go kaboom. I uh, apologize for reading fast, which is what might actually do. Because I love reading fast. Spoils to be deserving. Mikhail was a man who had been active in the Federation's industrial landscape. He had owned several and bought and sold many more factories and plants of all kinds. For many years, it had been a difficult existence, but no longer. Now the rewards long promised were finally being delivered. The benefits pledged by the Siberian plan had been realized, and economic activity within the Federation was rapidly increasing, both vertically and horizontally. They had more factories, more jobs, more production, also and critically for Mikhail and his contemporaries. They had more money and lots, lots more. He'd been watching the stock market all morning, and the shares listed added upon nothing but rise for his company, uh, for the companies of his friends, and most of all, for the companies that the government had chosen to favor. Even better, the rise showed no signs of stopping. It was truly a great day, of course. There were those who claimed the money was not going anywhere needed, or that it should be redirected to the more to those who needed it, with the exact definition that need left purposely out. Or n nebulous. But Mikhail had paid them no mind. Wherever the money was going, likewise, was coming in to, to him. Enough was coming to him. And truly, was anyone else more deserving? The fruits of labor. Ooh! Um, yes. Heavy construction? Yeah, I'll do that one by now. Build, 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 build. It'll help out much later. The Virgin Lands Campaign. A new plan has emerged from the government to help alleviate the large amount of stress that has been put under our agricultural output. Simply put, as our population is inflated, our production of green is not. The issue is rapidly becoming the greatest crisis in Nova Siberia, besides the enduring pandemic, of course. Fortunately, the plan uh, our government has come up with is dealing with both the food shortage and the disproportionate population. By resettling refugees and farmers where the land is yet to be cultivated, ultimately, we will start improving our agricultural output and the lives of the refugees. The people's apocalypse. A nation of writers, poets, scholars, and the universities of Tomsk produce more manuscripts and manifestos than most people care to count. Yet one piece, published among uh, anonymously, has begun to spread controversy far and wide through Siberia. Oh, I've read this one before. If you want to read about this one, please go right ahead. The People's Apocalypse is a story uh, for others, not for us. What is this? Oh, raid? Khartoum? Oh, yeah. Oh, Russia, yeah. Um, I'll do them. Not much growth. Not bad. Deficits. You know, it could be a lot worse. Good. Kill each other off. More cap, more growth, more factory output. Who's what's not to love? Poverty's getting better. Well, wow, point three one, that's very nice actually. Um could still use more energy here, so we might go with uh reconnect Soviet power grids. The Cochran of Russia. Uh Yeah, try us. You're not even attack oh I guess okay now we got a division there. Hey, happy August though. God I love TNO so much. I love the economy system and whatnot. Can we do both of these? B 
beautiful. Right now we're doing. Oh, well, I guess we got go to the other one. God dang it, that sucks. We'll go against these guys. It's fine. Whatever. Never mind. Well then, severe power grids it is, and we'll go with schools. Schools are very important to make sure that they run efficiently. Very very important, as some people might not tell you. We want a good society. Two days left. Beautiful. And the beating heart of Siberia, increasing our GDP by 1.3%. Not much, but better than nothing. Ah. Fertilands, new beginnings. Constantine had been a rock rootless for many years. Originally from Tambov, he and his family fled eastwards during the German invasions, and his subsequent state collapsed, and like so many others, they found themselves with almost nothing, having to leave all his land and possessions behind. All roaming alongside thousands of others in the refugee communities outside Novosibirsk. He scraped by his labor while unable, while his wife worked in a laundry and his sons ran errands for merchants and artisans, but no matter what they did, they could not get ahead. There were simply too many people, and not enough well-paying jobs. The years of bitter disappointment were such that when his wife told him to sign up for the government's supposed new program, he had almost had not done so, thinking it was pointless. But now, standing alongside the road beside her and looking at the vast tracts of overgrown wildlands in front of them, he suddenly gave thanks once again because the land was now theirs. The program intended to address the refugee problem by settling them on the vast tracts of untitled land, removing them from the overpopulated communities while hopefully acting to increase agricultural output. Constantine didn't know how successful the former would be, but he very knew well that, at least in his case, the latter would very much be. He would make sure of it. There was a lot of very hard work to do. The house had to be essentially rebuilt, the fields needed to be cleared and planted, harvest to be planned. Constantine had never been a farmer, but the future promise for his family could not be ignored. They'd come home again, a land to call their own, and he would ensure that the state was repaid for its generosity. The state provides a beating heart of Siberia. But before we do that, anything else here? Um, go to new schools. What do we have here? Initiate raid against the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. Well, you know what? We're going to keep the guys down here just in case. Because if it fails, whatever. Oh, yeah, we can still do that. Holy crap. Oh. Novosibirsk thrives. The streets are brimming with people. Factories are chock full of workers, and any crime that remains is practically notice unnoticeable. The city is so rich that even the few beggars that remain appear fed and decently clothed. Such spectacles are a stark contrast to the anarchy of the East and destruction to our West. It appears their decisions have turned out better than we could have ever expected. Not that there was any doubt of their success. Developments are in agriculture, industry, and even our stability have made Novosibirsk the most desirable city throughout Siberia, despite the cost of free some freedoms. You know, there's always a cost associated, and that's okay. 1962, huh? Well, get some better trucks. We don't want to use that dude stuff, do we? No. We want some of the best, the best of the best, if we possibly can. Beautiful. Let's try it. They always pay the tribute. I love it. Um, with 77. Uh, beautiful. Increase production quotas. Yeah, heck yeah. Crackdown on strikes. Oh, we're gonna beat the striking out, strikes out of the strikers. Managerial response. Thousands of workers were on strike outside of a steel mill in the industrial sector of Novosibirsk. All across the city, similar s strikes were being carried out in a rage of the appalling conditions present in the factories. Corporate security guards made a loose and patchy ring around the striking workers, waiting for the orders from the superiors on just what to do. Vasily Minokovsky stood in front of the crowd and gave his fiery speech about the injustices of the corporations. He had come back to the town center of Bukharin, where the workers were given generous rights and conditions in the factories were as safe as they could be made. Behind him was a hung, tattered flag of the Soviet Union. The workers of Novosibirsk had decided they would not stand for the continued abuse. As it came to a lull in this orator, there was a change in the air. The corporate goons had retreated to the office across the street, and it soon became obviously why. Two corporate IFVs rolled down the streets toward the crowd, a man with a megaphone calling for the strikers to return to work. Well, then his demands were unanswered, the IFVs unleashed canisters of tear gas on the crowd. Cries went up as those nearest the gas panicked and fled, eyes and lungs burning, corporate goons advanced on the crowd, beating those they caught with batons, and then a shot rang out. The panicking workers trampled each other to get out of the line of the fire, while corporate security fired wantonly into the crowd. Vasily tried to regain some semblance of calm, but it was in vain as he was hit in the gut by a burst of fire from a panic guard. He fell, reaching for the flag of the Union. As he bled out, watching his friends be gunned down by the trigger-happy guards, he wept, all for the pursuit of profit. We're just trying to make, not America, but some Novosibirsk better. That's all we're trying to do. Corporate welfare. And the city of Novosibirsk, a group of men in corporate uniforms marched in the streets. They have been sent by the Sibir Corporation, or HQ, to intimidate the owners of a small steel mill in the industrial district. At their head was a young officer named Andrei Ugolov, a rising star in the corporate security world. They approached the mill from the south, truncheons in hand. From the north, however, came another group of corporate guards. These men, from Phoenix by the looks of them, were armed with rifles and occasional shotgun. As the two groups came nearer to one another, a third faction made themselves known, around the entryway to the mill. A small group of workers led by a strange mercenary sat behind the makeshift barricades. Armed with an assortment of old Soviet air rifles and pistols, they were led by a well-armed stranger clad in an old uniform. 
The two corporate teams caught sight of another, all heck broke loose. The more heavily armed groups opened fire, killing and wounding most of Ugalov's men. As he huddled around behind a low wall around the mill, he attempted to rally them, only to find they had either died or fled. The workers let their displeasure be known to them, as a stranger leading them shouted into order and opened fire on the corporate goons. The mill workers' sudden intervention came as a shock to the Phoenix Force, who were just able to secure cover after half of their numbers were killed. The stranger then pulled a small object from their pouch on his belt before throwing it in the middle of the remaining Phoenix Forces. An ear splitting, banging a shower of shrapnel was the last thing they knew before they were ripped apart. Andres looked around at the dead men all around him, and his friends and enemies, and they could only feel sort of numb acceptance. When he awoke this morning, he'd been a somebody, a rising star after today. He would be lucky to beg for scraps of the corporate HQ. The rising star must fall in the end, an internal situation. The internal situation within the Federation has continued to deteriorate in the recent months. Leftist revolutionaries have tried to undermine the stability of the state. Their methods of doing so have become increasingly heinous. The government will have to make difficult decisions on the freedoms of the people in order to, good job, Nixon, to take a harsh stance on such a dangerous dissent. Once the internal situation has been dealt with, we must hope that the regime will be strengthened enough to turn our attention on to our enemies that threaten the region. Wait, Guanxi League? What's going on in China? Huh. Well, whatever. I love coffee. Extreme investments might be good to do too on occasion as well. Uh, reconnect Soviet power grids. I kind of want to do it. Eh. By 30%. Beautiful. Now we have no debt. Look at that. Well, it's not, it doesn't matter too much right now. It's still good to do. At least in my opinion. Eh, we can't do anything else for now. Oh, never mind. There we go. Now we have a little bit more debt. No. Meaning restriction. Ah, we'll do this one. Expand the security agent agencies. Due to the vast increase in not only terrorist activity in major cities, President Pokrishkin has signed an executive order expanding the powers of the Sluzba uh, Besopasnosti, or SB. As the main federal security agency, Novus Repairs Kambar, and all the SB has kept the Federation safe from socialist and anarchist agitation almost since its foundation. Now, with these new powers, the SB should be able to act with impunity against socialist terrorists without intervention from local or federal governments. The Narodnex must be ended as soon as possible, lest it begin to cause chaos, and the SB is the only thing they will get the job done right. You betcha. Shit, you betcha. Anything down there? No. Anything up here? No. Okay, then. No resource efficiency extraction, which I'm not super concerned about, so. Um, oh, wait. Do we have... Oh, oh that's how much we have. We have no debt. Good. Very good. Deficit is getting worse, but whatever. A situation report. Create an intelligence agency. I love it. I love it. The president placed another sheet of paperwork alongside the inkwell from his signature before he even dried. Trying to work through a week of red tape in an hour before his meet with Glinka now. That an hour was almost upon him as his eyes flicked between the clock just above the, above the door and the paper before him. Finally breaking the tension, the rapping at Glinka's knuckles at the door, he could be heard, Come on in, Dimitri. The door was swung open and Dimitri shuffled in holding a stack of papers, drip, dropping it on Alexander's desk and adding another mound already collected there. What's all this? asked Alexander, lifting up the first sheet but glancing to his old friend first. Well, police reports. The workers and socials getting much more agitated with these conditions. What? This is twice as many civil unrest related arrests as last month. Concerning not Alexander, but predictable, I figured there'd at least be more of a catalyst, though. There is. The grain shortages are getting worse, which means less food for the workers. Which means more are taking to the streets so we can earn more money to feed themselves with grain that we simply do not have. Good lord. I'll see what I can do. I'll keep looking through these. Dimitri nodded and headed back out the door. Stopping just short of the threshold, he turned to hear another word from the president. And keep up with the good work, Dimitri. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well. There you go. Still, no debt. Freaking amazing. Uh, meet with Shukshin. The President of the Federation, Alexander Pokrushkin, is to meet with the Mayor of Barnall, for there has become a need to discuss the issues that are key to the lives of the people of Barnall and the future strength of the whole Federation. Barnall is rich in agriculture, the food that is desperately needed in the overpopulated cities throughout the Federation. An agreement would be made between the two parties, over likewise both are prospects. Otherwise, it would be bleaker. We hope that Pokrushkin will find a beneficial settlement with the Mayor, and the, for the betterment of both the people, of course. We might actually spend a little bit. We want a little bit more loyalty from these people. As long as it's above 50, that's what we really care about. So with Titan, even though it's not hurting us too badly in all honesty right now, we can still use a little bit more uh, help. Italy? Good job, Italy. Good job. Oh. Loyalty. Look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Also, if ever, um, I do want to warn you that if there's ever like, like any sort of like sound or music that gets played... Um, oh, look at that. Uh, that's copyright strike. I will, like, remove it from the video, so I do apologize about that. So, um, oh, new contract. 
or security question. Let's do that one first. Law enforcement has steadily become more and more difficult as tensions between the government and political agitators have led to terrorist attacks, which are suspected to have been orchestrated by rebellious socialists. These cowardly actions have caused a great deal of domestic instability, which cannot be allowed to continue. Security will have to be improved in order to combat the threat that the terrorists pose to our future. Let's see if we'll have to make these changes and maintain law and order, of course. Oh, no location set. We're just missing a crap ton of artillery, huh? But we're making it. We are making it, which is good. Any occupied territories? Not yet. Anything over here we really care about? Go and do that. Some people might want to start raiding us. Oh, they actually refused tribute this time. Interesting. Well, we'll see what we can do. These divisions are not bad. 12 combo is okay. I'd like to make them a little bigger. I already had these ones for these guys. These are elite infantry, so we will edit these divisions as we get more army XP and whatnot, which would be good, 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 good. Ooh, are we going to win? I mean, you can barn all, hopefully. Sorry, I don't have much time for pleasant trees, but we really must get down to business. Alexander Prokushkin was as blunt as usual, as he sauntered into Shushkin's mayor of office and barn all. The president was in there in person to negotiate for further grain and borders to the city in light of the growing threat of famine in the capital. Of course, Mr. President, Shushkin nodded, gesturing towards the seat across from his desk with Prokushkin quickly filled. People are dying, mayor. This needs to stop and soon. All right, how much grain do you need? How much can you give me? Not enough to send end any famines, but enough to last you until we have more stable, more supplies, certainly. It's really not entirely my grain. Several businesses have moved into the region and bought up the farms, which makes securing food for the state and moving it considerably harder. It's an important facility. Okay, I'll see what I can do, replied Shushin, picking up the phone and sliding an open drawer full of various scrap paper scribble with phone numbers. This might take a bit. I'll get back to you with some numbers soon enough. Beautiful. Investments? So now we have to wait for that. Um... Construction speed is always nice. Still, no debt. I love it. Uh, investigate the now next buzz war. Oh, look at that! Beautiful. Ah, shot for shot. May I introduce you a drink? Well, Christian said, keeping a careful eye over his guests. Mr. Shukshin, they sat in the living room of the president's house. From the wall sounded the clanging and chittering of daily vagaries. Uh, vagaries. Vagaries, while well, the workplace before them crackled, raiding at heat and light. You look like you use one. Indeed, you may, Shukshin said. My throat is parched, he laughed. The were farmers expecting an oral return. I'm afraid I don't have the voice for it. It's tough being a mayor, he met Pokrushkin's eyes, but I imagine it's hard to be a president. Pokrushkin gave him a wry smile. You don't even know half of it. The president of the Federation unscrewed a bottle of vodka and poured its contents into two shot glasses. Handing the other to Shukshin, he raised his cup to eye level to the Federation. Uh, to the Federation, Shukshin returned his toast and down the spirit in one gulp. Pokrushkin did the same. That is good. Strong, some good strong vodka. It's hard to find a good distiller this far east. Is it grain? Yes. Through the co cooperation between Barnum and the rest of the Federation, Pokrushkin smiled. Indeed, not worried, Shukshin, is how we will hold this Federation together. They sat in silence while the fireplace crackled. More and more drink? Please. Ah! I love it. Oleg, yes. One of the largest known terrorist groups, of course, in the country. Ooh, let's train him. Train, 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 train. <clears throat> Uh, has been carrying out attacks against people of Nova Zbysk. It's called Narodniks. The group is composed of socialist agitators who are attempting to top of the Falcon's regime. They perpetuated the violence within our borders for far too long and they'll have to be dealt with directly. First, we'll have to investigate the movements of the group to begin to understand how it functions as well as who is involved. But shortly after that, we'll have to start climbing down on their atrocious crimes, but watchful enforcers. It was far from a usual day from the everyday people of Nova Zbysk. Confused glances and shocked stares were aimed at the new presence of the streets, gazes which were per currently quickly turned away once they were returned. This is what the police they thought, yet none of the police they knew. They were better armed, there were a lot more of them, and they looked downright mean. It was clear they meant business, and in Nova Zbysk, it was a little more valuable than meaning business. A uh, few people whispered here and there, a friend of a friend, and said this or that about the government wanting to eradicate terrorism, and that the police presence wasn't keeping an eye on the ordinary people that the Narodniks blended into so easily soon. The whole street knew the news. Then the street nearby, and then the end of the day, everyone in the city knew there might be an unknowingly watched at any moment, for once. All complaints of the citizenry were silenced. All their usual bravery frozen in place. And instead of the usual dissatisfaction of the age, they felt something they hadn't felt in a long time. Fear. Every boot that hit the ground, every glare of the shot uh, at the gathered crowd, every officer placed at a key position to keep watch as all men as the people passed by, served only to reinforce that fear, a sort of dread comparable to being caught in a spider's web with no escape. As the days passed, and people grew used to the officers, however, the sense of fear settled down into a feeling of security, of protection. The spider's web had begun to feel more like a safety net for the common person, and as for the uncommon person, the Narodnik, the spy, the common thief, the spider quickly began to feast. And when screams soon silence were heard at night, nobody questioned why some officers needed their uniforms cleaned. It was better that way. A secure federation is a free federation. Beautiful. Um, in the meantime, we can do all of this stuff. We still don't have enough energy, which sucks. So we're going to come up here and uh, wait to do and increase production quotas or a new contract. Our conclusion on the future relationship of Barn on Novus Obersk is about to be reached between President Pokrushkin and the mayor of uh, Vasily Shukshin. You will learn what the benefits of living under the authority of Pokrushkin. Shukshin will also be made aware of the need to pay for such a vital service. 
The Shukshin will have to listen to our demands for the sake of Barnall's security. He will offer his farmlands. The fertile fields of Barnall will be used for the betterment of the entire population of the Federation, not just the mayor, the people who live under the mayor. He will learn that he must cooperate with their interests in the kind of uh, threat. Ah, yes. Mm, connect the power grids. We don't have enough. Don't let him get away, the security man shouted on the top of his lungs as he hunted the assassin. He's the one who tried to kill the president. Despite all his efforts, there was little he could do to disperse the crowds that were fleeing in every direction after the sound of the two missed gunshots echoed in the Nova Zabia Square. He turned on once, the Pokushkin with his characteristic uniform being escorted by a squad of agents to safety somewhere near his residence, but could not risk lose track of the assassin as he headed into the narrow road to the city. With all the energy he had left in him after his exhausting day of preparations, he ran as fast as he could, jumping over the objects and pushing over civilians, but always keeping his eyes on the target. However, they saw him reach the... Tabritsky's bridge and jumping over the railing. He shouted in the vein once the last time as the killer fell into the freezing waters of Ob River. Two days later, Pokrushkin was in a highly classified meeting in the presidential residence, together with Security Minister Glinka. The proof had been laid in front of him, and it was clear as day. The narrowniks were behind the recent attempt on his life. The trail of evidence had been followed by the trustworthy subordinates, and now it was time for justice to be served. Sir, things are different now. Glinka's hesitation in his voice was obvious, but he continued nevertheless. We thought the Narrownecks were a simple nuisance to the Federation, a small group that could be rooted out. The assassination attempt proved the exact opposite. They're a credible threat with an influence in the underworld, and one which we have to be dealt with, dealing with. There are already security measures in place, but we must go further. We must launch a war against this terror. Kushkin nodded in silence. Do what you have to. Oh my god, that's so bad. Jesus Christ, I'm not touching that. Man, I just want to make sure that we have enough money to continue expanding. A firm grip. Oh god, oh that's so bad. War sports stability. Oh the lack of political power. Why do you want to hurt me so badly? It's already nineteen sixty three, but still. Oh my god. But happy February, everybody. We have a little bit of debt now. God dang it. I hate debt. I got so much debt myself. The investigation begins. Glinka came up to the stage and reached for a podium's old microphone. In front of him were uh, tens of security service officers. Some he could recognize from the Federation's first days when it separated from the failed CSR, and they were the ones distinctly with more medals on the uniforms. Others, younger in age, were less decorated, but one could see their eagerness to work in their eyes. My fellow SP members, a looming threat has appeared. One threatening to tear apart what we've worked so hard to build. Glinka knew we had to speak decisively to get the message across. The narrow necks, unconvinced by our noble state and institutions, continue to wage a campaign of terror and, in fact, have. Uh, Wrapped up their efforts as they recently been made clear. It is our duty to restore order to these lands and eliminate the Red Mist before it eliminates us. President Pokrushkin has outlined specific measures throughout which we can fight these radicals, and as leading SBS officials, it is your duty to implement them. Thank you, and God bless Novosibirsk and Altai. Throughout the next week, the security service got to work. Hundreds, if not thousands, were arrested, sometimes due to blatantly clear social connections and others due to media rumors. In the dark alleys of the biggest cities, as well as in the mountainous countryside pit for the resident cells, many were caught, or re resistance cells, occasionally even being after ratted from civilian tower inside the government and the agencies. There's still little sense that this was the beginning of something bigger. Still a sense. A general campaign against this terror to root out the Narodniks once and for all. The question is, will it succeed? We have a firm grip, though. Stability. Has to be increased within the Federation, and we cannot risk any more form of dissent in case it involves any more violent form of resistance. We cannot allow violence to occur. We owe the people peace within the borders that they live. They surely understand this. The government has to tighten its control over the state. After all, they are aware of the dangerous alternative to stronger authority. Because of this reason, they must be allowed to strengthen their grip. They know what is, is and what is not good for the Federation, and they will make sure everyone is safer for it. The socialist terrorists menacing our state that are unknown number, and will conceal that our lack of information about their activities has allowed them to continue to get the better of us. They're guarded enough that the only way to discover their intentions from the inside. Sending SP agents to disguise as impressionable citizens to join their ranks will give us invaluable intelligence and allow us to draw them into our clutches without the Narodnecks suspecting a thing. It was a stormy night in Novosibirsk as Anton took a seat. The other Narodnecks were talking to each other, but he wanted to lay low. Barely any background checks did the Narodnecks suspect him or were they just that incompetent. As an undercover agent of the SP, Anton hoped that he wasn't being fed false information. Immediately after sitting down, the man wearing an old army uniform entered into the room, drift differing in age compared to the mostly young students who made up the Narodnecks cell. Good evening, comrades, said the older man. I am pleased to welcome our newest recruit, Anton Levitsky, to the revolution, as you know. Our fight against a tyrannical Alexander Pokrushkin is only just beginning. The Narodnecks as a whole have seen much success, yet our cells have done little to assess the rest of a camaraderie. If the revolution is to succeed, we must aim for the larger targets. Like what's it, Anton, turning his, on his... Uh, audio receiver and recorder. The armies have stepped up their game and would become a massive priority for the Nova Zobiesk government. I'm sure you know many of the rail lines across the Ob River, said the commander, taking down an entire bridge while Nova Zobiesk cut off, cut off in months, cut in half for months. And tell Grimace while the other known us cheered, if I may ask, commander, where are we going to get enough explosives to destroy the bridge and who's going to do it? Looking around, we don't have to seem very qualified, Anton said. The commander smiled. We have an ex excellent amount coming in from our supply, and Anton, you applied, saying that you are a demolitions expert in the Red Army, didn't you not? I think it would be perfect for the job. Supervise, of course. Looks like I'm blowing the bridge for the node next time. Of course, we just read Upper Grip, so. In the Slavic State. 
In contrast to the neighbors in the region, the Federation of Nova Sibirsk and Alta is a Sulevic state, a polity, where the political processes are under the guiding hand of the former and sometimes current military personnel. As a result, many civilian bureaucrats wishing to participate in traditional party politics find themselves barred from running for office, and the compliance demanded by the Sulevics, other non-military counterparts, can often be too much. In all of this, th uh, this is by design. Russia has moved past the need for a Soviet Union, for a central Soviet Republic, or for the monstrous, brutal ideologies that seek to dominate Russian political thought. The pedestrians may chant, Screw, Siloviki man, at every injury, but they are not aware of the bastion that protects them from the harm of ideological thought. But, we're going to end the episode there, even though we didn't finish the first focus sheet. That's okay, we've got a lot of warfare to do, and a lot of cleaning up to do, especially with these god-awful, godless Malignics. But, if you enjoyed the first episode, please consider leaving a fat like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we continue with the Code Talker update for TNO Brave New World. Thanks for watching, and have a great Pokrushkin the rest of your day!